you made an interesting point and you were saying that in Buddhism, there doesn't, they don't have these separate categories of emotion and, and, and sort of rationality or cognitive. And so people might think, you know, from a Western perspective that the problem here with desire is that there's this emotion of desire, right? And the, so you desire something, but you know you shouldn't have it. So this is rational, your, your reason and your desire or your, your cognitive and your emotion in, yes. in, um, at odds. And the solution to that is willpower. So you willpower to do what's right over the top of what you want, like what your emotion is. But what you're pointing out here is not only does Buddhism not have these separate categories of emotion and sort of cognitive things. They're not two separate categories. They're all sort of put together. But the the prob the, the solution therefore is never going to be will more willpower. Actually, rationality or the reasoning side of the equation is actually problematic alongside with the emotional side. Is that sort of when you started contracting? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly. So that you could think of. So the the point here is this: the desire in itself isn't the problem. It's the distorted cognition that it's caught up with. That's the problem. Okay, fantastic. So that's really the key. And so by the so in the beginning, there were parts of the Buddhist community, and there were many other non-Buddhist traditions that do think that restraint, like willpower, you know, this, you know, the various forms of the Sanskrit root yam, like niyama or ayama, to like restrain yourself. That is what you need to do. Just kind of resist the desire, and uh, you'll be able to sep you'll be able to separate your soul from it in a sense, right? But, and so there were members of the Buddhist, early Buddhist community too, it looks like, who really thought that that's what we needed. We just needed to kind of resist desire. But the dominant uh, strand, and certainly the strand that goes into Tibetan Buddhism, in Mahayana in India and then Tibetan Buddhism is, no, the real problem is not the desire, it's actually this confusion. That it's the confusion about the nature, first of all, of my own identity. Eventually, it's confusion about all of reality itself, right? Yeah, before, before we get there, can we talk about confusion in relationship? We could, we're talking about desire here, and I just want to go one step at a time. Before we get to selflessness or the self, I want to talk about the cognitive error in a way that, you know, you've been talking about how the desire exaggerates certain aspects or adds certain aspects. So there, like, there's a cognitive level error at that level could you talk to that because i think that really gets at why you might meditate on ugliness for example right yes. counter counteracting an exaggeration i just wanted you to talk about that for a little while yeah so this is to get to the yeah so if we get to the actual sort of the model that's underlying this right so the basic idea is okay we're confused uh we're having distorted cognitions and with those distorted cognitions are pretty much always in the context of trying to get stuff and avoid stuff to you know be happier and to suffer less so how would like we think of this in terms of a process we can identify a kind of moment where we actually perceive some things like let's say we use vision you know i see something i see i don't know an apple mm. and then i interpret it uh as an apple Right. If I if, so I have to pay enough attention to it that not only do I see it, but in a sense, I notice it and bring and categorize it or interpret it. And then based upon upon that interpretation, there's some kind of intention to act that comes that arises. So let's say, you know, I see an apple. I, I'm, I, I have a, uh, a sort of set of goals that I'm carrying around with me that are constantly changing and shifting. But a lot of those goals are basically, again, about being happy and not suffering. And so I think that this thing is going to like make me satisfied. Now, let's say, let's kind of make this absurd and say, oh, it's going to, you know, it's going to, this delicious apple is going to solve all my problems right now. So I therefore reach out to pick up the apple and eat it. So now I've got an intention to act. I see an apple. I interpret it as something, an apple, but not just an apple. I interpret it as something that either I want to get or I want to avoid. Because if it's not in one of those categories, I basically don't pay attention to it. That's the idea here. And this is at a very you know, low level of experience, right? And so I, uh, now I say, oh, this is the thing I want. I have an intention to get it. So that's desire right there. Like I have an intention. I want this thing. And then I, I maybe actually act or maybe I don't even act. So the key thing for the Buddhist standpoint is that the, uh, that moment of interpretation, 
right, is interpreting it in relationship in a confused context, right, where I, I'm interpreting it as something that's going to satisfy, I have a sense of my own identity at the first level of Buddhist philosophy, a sense of my own identity that this thing is going to somehow satisfy, and that sense of my own identity is false. Now, if we think about an apple, that's not maybe a very good example, but if we think about like another person, right, and the meditation on ugliness is really going to be about uh, uh, you know, attachment to persons. And I see a person and I feel like, you know, a sense of desire for this person. Like, you know, I want to, you know, be with them and they're going to solve my problems. If I could just be in a relationship with this person, everything will be perfect. So I see, I, you know, in, maybe I see this person all, all the time. Maybe I'm even married to them or whatever it might be. But I see this person, I interpret them in a particular way as like that which is going to satisfy me that turns out to be confused, okay? But based on that confused interpretation, I then have an intention to do something, you know, like approach the person with a certain expectation, of, you know, some kind of response or whatever, like, you know, gonna be happy to see me or whatever it might be. And then I'm gonna act on that, inter on that intention. So the, that moment of intention, so you've got those kind of phases, there's a, there's a perception, you interpret what you're seeing, and then uh, you have an intention to act, and then maybe you do act or you don't act. But because the uh, interpretation of what I'm seeing is, is confused, it's confused because it's always being interpreted in relationship to pleasing me or help, you know, making me happy or avoiding my suffering, but the sense of me is a false sense of me, right? A distorted sense of me. Therefore, whatever I do will always never quite work out. Like, it'll never fully satisfy me. This relationship, if I have that sense, this false sense of who I am, just like, you know, drinking gasoline at the gas station, and I can never make that person happy. Yep. So the actions that I engage in, based upon that faulty interpretation, are going to always somehow not work out. But most importantly, the interpretation is already itself setting up a kind of conditioning in my mind, 